This panel is called Teaching Students How to Learn from Podcasts, or I think there's also a longer name, How to Listen to Learn, How to How to Learn to Listen. Sorry, I just have the shorter one written. <laughs> um, and I'm Jessica McDonald, and I'm I'm one of the the panel facilitators, I guess maybe today. Um, Brooke, did you want to introduce yourself now, or I have a yeah, longer sure. spiel? But... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we'll go into more full spiels in our respective time. But um, yeah, so uh, alongside Jessica, I'm um, Brooke Covington, and um, I will tell you more about myself in a bit. But um, yeah, I th session leaders, facilitators, something of that respect, but really happy to be here. Me too. And I'm really excited to hear from everybody else and what um, everybody here has to say about teaching and learning with podcasts alongside podcasts. So um, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm Jessica. I'm Jessica McDonald. I'm from Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. So that's where I'm coming at you from today. Um, I'm a contract instructor at the University of Saskatchewan, which is where I'm teaching uh, mostly first year English classes, all sorts of English classes for first year. And then I also teach for second and third year some uh, decolonizing literatures classes and indigenous literatures of the prairies classes. Um, as a white settler, I teach those things. Um, what else? Oh, I'm also a podcaster. So separate from um, that, I, I podcast in um, a podcast called Teaching Books, Teaching Books, no G. Um, and it's all about the ways people teach, learn and work with literature. Um, obviously, the session is about like teaching with podcasts. Um, so I'm not really talking about my own podcast, but I wanted to just give a couple of examples of the ways that I've used podcasting or podcasts or listening to podcasts in the classroom. So basically, for my portion of today, just for a few minutes, I'm going to talk about three different things I've done with podcasts in the classroom. Um, I've used them in a whole bunch of different ways, just like I assume some other folks in the room have um, in the Zoom room. I've used them just as content communication, like as part of students sort of required reading, like here's, you know, some material for you, which is probably the most basic way. Um, I've used them as part of critical thinking or listening exercises. Uh, I've used them as objects of literary study, like so in the same way that we would study a novel in, in my English classes or poems, um, I've gotten them to study, you know, close listen to and study uh, podcasts. And then probably other ways as too as well that I'm not um, remembering right now. I actually should have tried this out before, but I'm just going to see if I can share my screen to give you a couple of examples as I talk. If I can't, that's fine. Can you see that? Okay, great. Yeah. So these are I literally just threw these in my um, <laughs> this little slide thing just right before because I thought, okay, some of the things I'm talking about seem a little bit abstract if you don't have the example. So these are sort of decontextualized. Um, examples of what I'm going to talk about. So I realize they might won't make perfect sense and I could have been more prepared in a better world. But um, so the first way I wanted to talk about that I've used podcasts in the classroom is to teach students about paratext. And I often will teach about paratext, which is Gerard Jeanette's term for all of the text that sort of surrounds a work like a work of literature, but is not the literature proper. So like the cover image of a book or the copyright page or the about the author page or um, chapter titles or the title itself, all of those are paratext, right? And so I'll often teach students about paratext, but um, I've started to teach paratext through podcasts, which I find kind of like a cool um, feature of teaching podcasts that you can really get into how paratext shapes meaning and is meaning right but in a different way than literary written like traditional novels or that kind of, kind of thing so this example that you're kind of seeing decontextualized here is um, from my indigenous storytelling of the prairies class where i teach a podcast as a like again i don't know how to say this but as an object of study like for a couple of weeks in the class we study one podcast called kiwayu um, which is a podcast by david a robertson who um, uses this like five-part podcast to sort of rediscover his cree roots and ancestry and talk to his family and sort of has the theme of identity through storytelling within it so it fits really well within the class. And we study the podcast just like we would any other um, literary text that we look at in that class. 
Um, but in this case, like this slide that you're seeing, which also is sort of a writing related slide, which makes it, I realize, even more kind of confusing. But um, for this particular uh, example that I'm bringing up, I was using the podcast Kiwayu as a, I think, useful way to teach about the meanings of paratext, like how we can close read paratext around the podcast in the same way that we might read text or in the same way that we might read, you know, a passage from a novel. And we can discuss how the paratext of podcasts frame the meaning of the podcast too. So I'm obviously not going to read all from this, but what I mean by this is things like the outro, um, like the list of collaborators that David A. Robertson includes in his outro of the podcast, you know, the, the last thing you say, like the sign off with all of the acknowledgements and that kind of thing, which I frame here as a form of paratext. Um, the episode titles, I get them to look at and sort of derive meaning from. The show notes, I consider paratext. I think that's maybe more contentious. It could be seen as text. But the show notes that accompany the podcast, I get them to sort of analyze and specifically look at. Um, and then make meaning out of. So as an example, this is like a paragraph coming from a specific activity we did. And that's the decontextualized part. But as an example here, this green part or this highlighted part right here, um, I try to get the students to make meaning out of paratext like the outro. In this case, it says every episode of Kiwayu ends with an outro that lists Robertson's collaborative producers on the podcast, including CBC Manitoba, et cetera, et cetera. In this gesture of gratitude for those helpers, Robertson shows explicit acknowledgement that this self-investigation of his family roots and identity is a relational effort. So again, just one example of the ways that I've used sort of podcasts to um, teach about paratext, teach about the meanings of paratext, but also kind of uniquely teach it because it's not the same way, you know, looking at an outro or looking at the episode titles or looking at the show notes, is not the same way that I would teach paratext with like a literary, a literary work. Example number two is I've used podcasts to teach citational politics, like um, yeah, the de deliberate choices behind who we cite, why we cite them, and that kind of thing. Again, this is a slide just pasted in from one of my um, one of my days talking about this text, but it was also about Kiwayu. And we had just learned what citational politics were in the last day of this class in Indigenous Storytelling of the Prairies. And so I asked the students in this Chatterfall activity, like whose voices David A. Robertson was including in the podcast, whose voices were prioritized. And then we had a large group discussion about what those kind of citations, like him including certain interviews, certain people's voices, what those citations meant for his, like the politics of his show, um, you know, he was including community members, a lot of his dad's voice, a lot of, and his dad actually ended up passing away during the time of the um, podcast. So that became even more sort of charged with meaning. So we were able to talk about podcasts in relation to citational politics and like it just sort of opened up um, new ways of thinking about citation because for students, I think especially first and second year students, they don't often think of an interview or somebody's voice being included in a podcast as a form of citation. It might not align with our usual kind of traditional white Western ways of thinking about citation, right? Like citing through reference, citing through um, scholarly reference, right? And the last example I have here, I'll just skip over to this. I actually did include this um, little listening and reflection exercise, which is just three questions in the handout that I think we're gonna link to um, for anyone to take a look at. But this is an exercise I've used in a different teaching context when I teach graduate students about how to podcast their research and their um, creative work in, in some cases, but mostly their research. And in the middle or like at some point in time, sorry, I'm just going to try to close this chat. Okay. In the middle of that, those workshops for graduate students on how to podcast their research, I like to do a listening exercise. And I, I always usually show the same clip or listen to the same clip, which is from season four, episode 23 of Dr. Hannah McGregor's Secret Feminist Agenda. It's the first six minutes or so quite a long clip. And I asked them to think about how the sounds of this scholarly podcast, which is actually peer reviewed in some of its seasons, 
um, align with their own personal, like brought in expectations about what a scholarly podcast should sound like or could sound like. And of course, as you can see here, I asked them to think about that in terms of the actual sounds, like the music used, like the tone, the intonation, silence, whatever, as well as the content, like the script, the words spoken, um, and then anything else they kind of want to want to think about in relation to how this um, scholarly podcast aligns with or doesn't align with troubles, frustrates, expectations, their existing expectations of what scholarship should feel like or in their senses sound like. All right, that's my last example. Just three little bits of uh, maybe like three little bits of the ways that I use podcasts in teaching and learning. So um, that's all I'll say for my part. Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so yeah, Jessica and I, when we were meeting to go over this, we have lots of overlap and interesting, um, ways in relation to how we, um, you know, teach and learn and, and play with podcasts. Um, and so I'll, I'll give a bit more of an introduction to me. So, um, like I said, I'm Brooke Covington. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the English department at uh, Christopher Newport University, which is in the Tidewater region of Virginia. Um, we're a small liberal arts and sciences um, public university. We've got about 5,000 students. Um, and I wear a bunch of different hats at the university. So I teach in the English department, but I'm also our academic director um, for the Center of Community Engagement. So um, part of that role uh, gets both students and faculty kind of prepared to um, go out into the community to engage in impactful and meaningful ways. Um, so that's one of my roles. And then I also direct our civic engagement and social justice minor. Um, and through that minor, I'm able to teach lots of interdisciplinary courses. Um, and so a bit of backstory on how I got into podcasting. Um, I attended the uh, National Humanities Center's Podcasting Institute um, back in the summer of 2021, I believe. Um, and that's a, a just a great opportunity. I can't um, emphasize it enough. If there are um, novice podcasters in the room, which I still feel like I'm a novice podcaster, so uh, you're 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 totally welcome and celebrated in this space. Um, but I would really recommend looking into the National Humanities Center's Podcasting Institute. Um, it's a collaboration with San Diego State University's uh, Digital Humanities Center, and it was just a wonderful experience. Truly, it taught me how to podcast. Um, and so from doing that, I then moved into the fall of 2021, and I was teaching um, an intro course on civic engagement and social justice. And I felt like that was... Um, that was maybe the perfect opportunity to experiment a little bit with critical listening and critical making um, in relation to podcasts because it was fresh on my brain. It was something that I wanted to do, but uh, like I wanted to create a podcast, but I know myself and I, I kind of knew that if I didn't attach it to a course um, or a research project that it would probably be one of those things like playing the guitar or learning how to sew that I also don't know how to do, but would love to know how to do. So, um, so you know, knowing myself, I I went into IDST 250, that's what the course is, Interdisciplinary Studies 250, um, and, you know, I'm a writing professor, I'm in the English department, my PhD is in writing and rhetoric, and Jessica and I had this conversation that I've always been kind of troubled um, by standard language ideology, right, the assumption that academic writing um, scholarly writing um, or research has to be delivered in standard English, um, and so I use IDS 250 as a place to engage a little bit with critical race theory, which is a um, theory that's under attack uh, in Virginia, but really all across the United States right now. And so we grapple with critical race theory and the specific methodology of counter storytelling. Um, and so I don't want to go too, too heavy into the theoretical frameworks that I use to kind of um, frame all of the work that we do in the class, but we counter storytelling is really an effort to um, basically 
shed light on the fact that in society and in our institutions and in history, um, there are things called stock stories, right, which are developed from the majority perspective, from the dominant perspective. Um, and then there are these things called counter stories, right? These are the stories that exist on the margins. They're often told um, by folks who are um, under the heels of oppression, right? They um, and, and often stock stories are so troubling because they become naturalized to the point that they appear true. They just appear true. And so we as a class try to disrupt some of that storytelling by listening to podcasts that amplify counter storytelling. And then also by creating our own podcast where we try to um, think through some of the stock stories that exist in our local community and then use community voices to basically amplify counter stories in our neighborhoods um, about things like gun violence or about things like um, what it means to be a primarily white institution in a primarily non-white community. Um, and so that's kind of the theoretical lens that we bring and, and the methodological lens that we bring to this work. Um, and so, so yes, I, I do engage um, with creating the podcast with the students. Um, I, I don't want to eat up uh, too much time because I would really love for us to have just um, conversation about questions you might have. Um, I do want to share that uh, we this, I want to direct you all to the comments section, the chat box, where um, I'll dump it again in case folks came in a little later. Um, this is a Google Doc. I can go ahead and share my screen um, if it's helpful. Um, so we, let me get this away. All right, and I'll make it a little bigger for us. So really, Jessica and I just decided to curate um, some resources that we tap into either when we're using, when we're creating podcasts ourselves um, or creating podcasts with students or listening um, to podcasts with students. Um, so there's a couple like active listening reflection prompts or exercises. Um, I dropped in my sample podcast assignment I also, um, so the way that my podcast assignment works is I put students in groups of three or more. It's usually three to four students, depending on how the numbers shake out. Um, the students go through an assignment sequence. Um, they have to develop a group contract, which we can talk through what the group contract looks like. But um, I've really found that, uh, you know, I don't want to say forcing, I'll say inviting, inviting students to complete a group contract that outlines when they're going to meet each week, how they're going to stay in contact with each other, what roles each person is responsible for, and a work log really helps um, with not only assigning individual grades on a group project, which is just like a logistics concern for me as the teacher, but it also helps them um, kind of understand and recognize that conflict is going to happen in a group situation likely, um, and that if we set kind of boundaries or ground rules or principles for the way that we want to engage, um, if communication breaks down or if there's any other kind of breakdown, um, that that's just good practice moving forward as professionals. Um, so we do a group contract. They write an episode proposal, which they pitch to me and the rest of the class. I give them feedback. Um, they do have to conduct at least one interview, and that interview has to be a, a community perspective. So off campus, I encourage them to try to tap into voices that have not been heard or do not already have a platform. Um, lots of students are like, I'm going to interview the mayor. And so I always ask them, like, do you think the mayor needs to be interviewed again? <laughs> um, and so just getting them to think through, like, you know, what would the local business owner down the street maybe have to say about, about this topic? Um, and that community expertise exists beyond kind of traditional assumptions about people, right, in public roles. Um, so they do the interview protocol assignment. I get them to transcribe their interviews. They have to transcribe the whole episode. Um, we talk a little bit about accessibility, right? Making sure that our podcasts are accessible. Um, we talk about, I, I love that Jessica brought up citational practices in, in podcasts because we talk about verbal citations, but then also providing um, our references in the podcast notes. Um, and, and then we just threw in a bunch of, these are resources 
resources that Jessica and I both um, use either, like I said, for ourselves when we're creating podcasts or with the students, there's an open access textbook, um, lots of things about centering marginalized voices in your podcast. Um, and then we just listed some recommended podcasts that we've found um, to be particularly useful when, um, you know, bringing into the classroom um, or when listening to learn. So um, I'm going to stop there. I'm happy, eager to talk through the logistics. I do train my students. So I take time out of class to actually show them how to edit sound. We use Audacity um, and I take them on a field trip to our media center in our library and show them how to check out microphones. I show them how to use their voice recorders on their phones. Um, and I also create a podcast episode alongside them so that, you know, hopefully they have some a, a little bit more buy-in and recognize that we're all in this together and it's something that we can all um, have agency in and feel proud of. Um, and so, yeah, I'll I'll stop there, but um, but I'm eager to talk more. So I we'd really just like to know where questions are, um, and we have some talking points, but we'd like to hear where where you all are at. I guess maybe I should. Are there any questions? <laughs> I am curious. Um, you have some cool recommendations. That handout sounds looks so useful. Thank you. Um, but like, how? What are? What thought process goes into choosing, especially assigning podcasts to students? How do you decide? There's so many to choose from. What What considerations do you think are most important? I, I'm going to be teaching a podcast as literature type class, so I would just want all your advice. Are you doing then like um, fictional podcasts, like ones that tell a narrative, like a fictional narrative or no? I mean, I haven't decided yet. I need okay. to, I need, and I'm probably going to ask for student input and yeah. be like, there's a, a universe and a half of podcasts. Where do you want to go? And I guess podcasts as literature is maybe not the right term, but it's a humanities, it's a lower level humanities credit podcast theme because I love podcasts and I'm not, I'm still designing it. So I'm, I'm thinking about like, what, how do you like design that kind of course and choose from so many things? I love that reflective listening exercise that you mentioned, Jessica. But like, how'd you pick that clip and why? <laughs> uh, well, that was for a very specific series yeah. of workshops that I give for graduate students that are worried oftentimes about like whether podcasting will seem scholarly in there. And that makes sense because it has material effects on, you know, the job search and that kind of thing. So um, I already was familiar with Hannah McGregor's Secret Feminist Agenda as one of the few peer reviewed podcasts I know about, like a few of the seasons, not season four. But He's so amazing. I thought, OK, well, th yeah, <laughs> this is a great podcast to use because it's a peer reviewed podcast. So it's kind of bringing in those two things that I know that some graduate students are worried about, which is what kind of research counts towards, um, you know, hiring or towards um, academic sort of CVs and that kind of thing. Um, I was just going to say, though, that like other podcasts I've included, like Kiweu, I think part of my decision process, other than the fact that for Kiweu, it was um, a very kind of, it was a narrower scope, of course, Indigenous storytelling on the, the prairies of Canada or what is currently called Canada. So it kind of like plops me into a certain geography um, and certain types of makers. But another thing that why I chose Kiweu instead of other um, indigenous podcasts of the prairies is because the form and the content uh, come together really cool in cool ways. Um, and that's what I think is super cool about teaching podcasts as like literature is getting students to think about like the formal stylistic dimensions of the podcast. Like, why is there this moment of silence here? Why is there this like particular transition music? Why do, why does, um, the podcaster, the producer, the editor choose to fade out here and then fade back in. So when there's like a merging of content and form, that's really um, generative or rich. I think that's what guides me most to use those podcasts. I don't know about. I 
So I guess I'm also, um, I, I tend to like some of what I do with podcasts is more in like the social science-y kind of realm, but, um, I, my research is on material rhetoric and the rhetoric of monuments and memorials. Um, and so I tend to go with place-based, uh, I, I tend to gravitate towards place-based all things. Um, and so one of the, we we engage a lot with the 1619 project because um, I think, right, for a class that's about civic engagement and social justice, there's not even just the podcast itself, which is gives such rich fodder, right, to talk about those topics, but also the controversy that exists around 1619 and the racism, right, that was exhibited by lots of white historians who um, kind of came after and attacked this project. Um, and so we talk, and, and really how whiteness is enacted in a lot of those critiques of 1619. Um, and also I'm in Virginia and we're like 25 minutes from Point Comfort, which is where the first enslaved people were brought to the US. And so it just feels like, um, you know, like these students, I think some it's easy for students to feel like content in the classroom is really far from them like that's that's far from me but I tell them like no this happened less than 20 miles down the road um we can go right now and listen and experience in the same way that um Nicole Hannah Jones right brings in uh clips of like the water splashing against the uh, against Fort Monroe which a lot of my students only know Fort Monroe as the place where you go to the beach and so, you know, I, I tend to pick based on place um, and and the issue that uh, it sounds like Jessica is similarly situated, right? Picking something kind of based on the place and then how, how that how does that place then um, connect to the content of the course? I don't know if that helps answer the question. But, but yeah, that's no, it's very useful. It's kind of what I was after is like how, like your framework for narrowing it down and thinking about location, that's something I hadn't thought about before. So that's cool. I have lots of decisions still to make. It's a very broad course and I could go in lots of directions. So we'll figure that out. We'll let some other people ask. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, the resources you provided to are amazing. I know you said you were um, maybe not at some of the earlier talks, but we, um, some of us put together a, a podcast teaching manual and I feel like there's so many rich resources here that I'm excited to, to go through myself and maybe in touch with you both about, about that. Um, but I have a question for you just about the textual with this and, and just how you think about that more specifically. If, um, I wonder, do you pair certain texts or like physical research with these projects in terms of sources or um, are students really just working on the podcast in, the, in and of themselves as a text? Because I know that's something we talk about a lot is how much do you feel the pressure to like bring in the, you know, the more traditional sources and how much um, do you let these units stand on their own? So I'd love to just hear your approaches to that. I, I, I don't mind, Jessica, I can go, you can go. Um, so I, I really think that, so my students tend to engage um, when I assign different kinds of text. So I've been playing a lot with like DH projects um, in terms of assigning DH projects and telling them like, go, go play around in this place, right? Um, so there's this really great DH project on um, the 1969 occupation of Alcatraz, right? Like the Indian occupation of Alcatraz. And I'm using that term um, purposefully. That's how they want to represent the occupation. Um, but right, like that the Native American people's took over Alcatraz for a time. And that's not the narrative that we tend to associate with Alcatraz prison. Um, but another thing, so, right, I, I explained that like the, the theory or the method that I'm bringing to the class is counter storytelling, which is something I bring in in my own research. And so, um, like I said, I, I researched the rhetoric of public monuments and memorials, and my recent uh, project is on Confederate monument controversy. So a lot of times I will assign students more traditional, right, like journal article readings about that topic. But then when they come into class, um, I'll play clips 
from public hearings where um, people in their own voices are explaining why this Confederate monument should not be situated in front of a courthouse. And so I really try to, um, and, and we talk about the differences, like what's more convincing, convincing, right? And, and, and what's more compelling, um, you know, like how, how does it, how do you experience these arguments differently when they're said in the voice of the person who's experiencing it rather than through the lens of the practitioner or the researcher, right, who is, um, who is researching it? And, and then we talk through, like, how do podcasts open up research in a way where folks can speak in their own voices and get credit differently than being an object of study in a journal article? if that makes sense, right? And I say that knowing that I, I've, I've objectified, right, like interviewees in that way in my own scholarship. And so I really want to push to them that like podcasts can revolutionize. I mean, not to like be like burn down the system, but kind <laughs> of um, that if we accepted these as an academic form of study, right, as an, as an academic genre, um, we could let folks let right but we people could speak in their own voices and we wouldn't colonize those stories um at least not as as grossly yeah no i think that's an amazing framework thank you so much for sharing that i don't think i, I have anything too much to add i would love to hear what other folks think about that question the only thing that was coming to my mind is very recently like in the last couple of weeks i was teaching um jamaica kincaid's a small place alongside um not kind of in the same day, but in the same week, um, the article Decolonization is Not a Metaphor by Tuck and Yang, which is a traditional, I guess, peer reviewed article. And then also alongside um, the podcast episode Unpacking Colonialism, I think the episode is called by Alpaca My Bags, a travel <laughs> podcast. And all those three things together. So, you know, kind of primary texts that we're looking at Jamaica Kincaid's A Small Place about um, Antigua and colonial and touristic practices around Antigua, as well as the, of course, the Islanders perspective. And then this podcast episode about, uh, well, they frame it as neo-colonialism and travel and alongside this academic article. And a couple things that came out for me just in seeing my students um, uh, talk about those three things is that the podcast episodes, simply by nature of it being kind of informal, um, an informal interview, really like dialogic, really, um, what's that word, like spontaneous almost, it ended up going into avenues of maybe avenues that wouldn't be represented in scholarship because they're improper or too vulnerable or too personal sometimes or too um, playful. And that helped the topics in that episode, such as teaching English overseas and like the colonial dimensions of that and being a digital nomad and the dim colonial dimensions of that. It helped those things become more like legible in their connections to a, a Jamaica Kincaid's A Small Place and the peer reviewed article. So it was something about the playfulness, the casualness, the informality of that particular episode that I think made more legible and more like immediate and current and relevant the same topics that were going on in Kincaid and in the article by Tuck and Yang. Yeah, that's great. I'm always struggling to find ways to make scholarly articles accessible. So I love hearing exercises that that kind of help you do that. Thank you guys. Looks like we have a question in the chat, uh, which is funny because uh, Jessica and I talked about this uh, during one of our planning meetings. Um, so Jill asks, um, when we talk about people speaking in their own voice, how do you teach students to mindfully edit voices or decisions to be unedited? Um, so I, I, I'd love to hear how other folks address this. Um, I think it helps to frame a lot of what we're doing um, as a counter story um, kind of approach to doing research um, where they're already hopefully com coming around to the fact that like, st like um, that we have to be really careful and intentional with the stories that are shared with us. Um, and so one way that I try to um, 
talk about the ethics of editing others' voices um, is to say that all of the students, we, we peer review the episodes, right? So we peer review um, in class, each group pairs with another group and we do some peer review. Um, and once they kind of do their revisions, um, before I publish the episodes to Spotify, um, I ask all of the groups to send their episodes to their interview participants and get their approval, right? Um, so, you know, to say this is this is how we edited the interview for time reasons or for clarity. Um, is this all right with you? Is there anything that you would like to add? We can do a follow-up interview. Um, it, it's not a perfect, right? Like it's not a perfect system. And, you know, folks, as storytellers, we know that our stories kind of shift in their meanings over time, probably for, I mean, I I feel that way about stories in my life. Um, so it's not a perfect system. And I'd love to hear what other people do um, to address to address this because they have to be edited. Most of the interviews go for a, a pretty, like most of them are over an hour. Um, and so there's some editing that goes on, but how, how do other folks in the audience deal with this issue? or Jessica as a podcaster <laughs> as well. Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, I was just gonna say, the, um, I know for me, I I go over my editing process with the guests. Like I tell them exactly how and why I'm going to do what I'm gonna do in the edit, which is basically pull text, pull quotes and um, anything like people's names and places and stuff to make a list like that people can kind of go to, to kind of, you know, see what what you know go more in depth into those things um i tell them that if they feel like they need to start over they can i will like take that out and whatever they want like but i i feel like i i also allow the episode to go an hour or so like i like my there is more long form because it's not you know I'm, I'm okay with that so it's definitely more natural i kind of allow like the 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 pauses i might break like down a longer pause but I'm really trying to get the most natural conversation feel to the podcast, but it's definitely, I go over that with them right, right in the beginning. So they know how it's all going to come together. And they, if they have any like things that they need me to know or things that they don't want said, or even later on, because the pot, the episodes are far apart. Like I have like 14 episodes, like in the backlog. So it's just like, if there was something you remember or something, just let me know. And then I've, that's only happened like once or twice or someone's like, oh, there's a part here. Make sure like that doesn't go because I'm talking with academics and teachers that might say something about a school that they work at. So they don't want to like, you know, also like put that in jeopardy. But yeah, it's been much more naturalistic in my case. Do you all mind if I jump in on this topic? Please. <laughs> My apology. I, uh, I'm a little bit tired. It's kind of late where I'm at. Um, yeah, it, the oral history approach is a really good one for these long form interviews. And at my university, we work with our digital archi archivist to make sure we're getting those oral history agreements. But not only that, to speak to a point that was previously made, it's to, to say before and after the interview, are you still in agreement with the content of this interview? Because if you do it before, that's great. But sometimes people have second thoughts after they've said something, and we want to respect that as well, even though it could be very inconvenient that they decide to yank an entire interview, for example. Uh, but we, we want to let students know that that is an opportunity we want to present to, to guests uh, out of respect for them. Uh, so yeah, that's that's one approach that we we definitely use, and just trying to edit ethically, that's that's the key. That was also mentioned. You, you we really have to let them know to not take people's words out of context. And I teach in journalism, and if it's a politician, you just can't change the quote. You you, you have to provide the full context, uh, just to avoid any issues. So those are some of my thoughts. And the link that I put in the chat has a lot of information about doing those oral history interviews. If anyone wants to check that out. Thank you. Thanks so much. That's like, I feel like I'm so um, just my mind is percolating with what everybody's saying right now, because I haven't done the making of podcasts with students. Like, so I haven't done what Brooks 
done and what others of, of you have probably done, which is making a podcast with students. But I'm just thinking about my own editorial ethics in my own podcasting experience. And this goes along with what Daniel was saying, but I don't know if it's natural conversation because it might actually be somewhat unnatural, but I always think about teaching books as like trying to make the labor of hard thinking, like the hard labor of hard thinking visible. And oftentimes that comes through in our language, right? Like in disfluencies or in like, you know, how I speak and <laughs> that kind of thing. And so even though I guess like professional podcasting practice is that you should develop some sort of microphone technique and of course you should modulate your voice for different reasons and adopt like a probably a slower pace of talking and that makes sense for accessibility and listening reasons well i don't talk like that and so i really like to present my actual voice and um try not to edit or mess that up later because i want to show like the tra transparently show the realities of you know, even right now, as I'm searching for language, searching for a word, I don't really like the idea of cutting that out of a podcast episode. I'd rather leave it in. But then I actually do the exact opposite with guests where I tell them they can absolutely cut out anything and I give them multiple different levels and stages of the um, process where they can do that before, during, after a second round of edits, third round, like I will literally cut out tiny little bits of ums and ahs if they wish. And so even though my podcast editorial ethics largely are like, and I am upfront about this with the guests, make the hard labor of hard thinking visible. I'm also like, but consent is more important. And so your consent in this interview to me, just for my own ethics, like trumps that. So um, I will have, you know, ed uh, edits two times, two rounds of edits of like 30 plus little things each. And that's okay with me for one guest. Sometimes, sometimes they don't even listen to it. And that's also okay with me as long as they're okay with it. Do we have other questions? Hi, um, thank you. That was all really fascinating. And um, it sounds like you put so much labor into your podcast. I'm so impressed. Um, I, this is a very um, self-centered question. I've just, I, I teach here in Australia. It's very early in the morning. So forgive my uh, random thinking. And I've just taught a digital humanities subject we just finished our semester so the assessments are coming in now one of the things that students could do is create a podcast and we we only had one two-hour session on showing them how to do it and I thought that most of them would choose something easier like making a blog but actually some of them are making podcasts um, but I really I'm really fascinated by this idea of the podcast becoming something that can be peer reviewed that stands on its own so I wasn't brave enough for that I may I've got them to write a thousand word reflective essay to talk about the process as well but I wondered whether you had any thoughts on what you know should I take that away because the podcast should be able to stand on its own or or maybe we have conversations in class about it um, rather than you know you must write this fully referenced standard English piece for me because that's what we've always done um, so that I can uh, improve my subject next year maybe. I don't know Jessica do you want to take this one or should I I it, it it was hard for me to come around to I mean I'm a writing teacher right so like it, I felt and I'm pre-tenure so I felt like concerned that what would my um superior what would you know like my chair or the FRC or the DRC um, my review committees what would they think of um you know a writing teacher who has her students podcasting and I don't force them to script it out beforehand. So, you know, I explained to them that lots of really, really good podcasts, even the ones that don't seem scripted are scripted, <laughs> um, you know, and that it takes some, uh, some practice to sound like you're just talking when you might be using a script. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, 
so I still give parameters around the podcast, just not just like, but very similar to an academic paper, right? Like I still say you have to verbally cite X number of sources, um, or you like, you have to bring in an interview participant and that that can count as a source, um, because I want them to see the community as a place where expertise is grown in the grassroots. Right. Um, and so, um, yeah. And like Jill's saying in the comments um, that show notes and transcripts, right, that I, when they have to transcribe their episodes, I tell them that's where you put in your in-text citation, right? But that you also need to verbally, like you don't have an in-text citation when you're just talking with your voice. Um, and so you, we talk about verbal citational practices. Um, and, you know, I... But at the same time, I understand that my students are having to learn a new technology and that that's going to cut into, right? Like if we all have a pizza pie of how much time a project is going to get, some of that pie has to go to literally learning a new technology. Um, and so I do some of that work in the classroom um, to try to lower the amount that that pie is coming out of, you know, that, that to reduce the slice of, you know, the size of that slice. But um but I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's possible to, um, if you write a, an assignment prompt that has clear instructions to have it be a scholarly product. Um, Jessica, do you have, do you have thoughts or anyone else in the room? I, I will say when I first started doing podcasts with my students, I had the same anxiety that, that you're speaking about. And I used to have them remediate the podcast into a paper so that I would have that like traditional paper there, but I will say when I finally pulled back and made the podcast a standalone, um, I feel like the stakes were raised and, and like Brooke's saying, I was able to treat it like the scholarly product I wanted it to be. So um, a lot of writing can take place beforehand, but I feel like if you got, have a clear rubric and you go into it with, um, just like you're saying, um, the verbal citations, I have them submit like a hyperlink citation page with it, but um, I do ask them to think about everything I would in a traditional paper. So I've started to let myself consider it um, as that final standalone product because I want it to be content in form um, and I want them to think about it in that way. I think sometimes if you pair it with something else, they tend to think of it as only content and that's okay because it helps them reach something else. But I think if you're interested in the content in form part, you could get to, to a really nice place. Does that help a little bit? I, I like do the, 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 if a student wants to do, there's a, in my project arc for my writing class, like it's, the second project is a most of multimodal or multimedia project. So when students do like a podcast for that, um, it becomes like the research launching point for like the, the last project, which is a deeper like writing project. So they, they almost use it like to archive new research if they do in interviews or conversations with students or even doing their own research for, for something and trying to like work through something. They, they almost like can then quote their own work or create an archive of research that they feel like isn't isn't available to them so like they, it's almost like they focus on the ideas of what a podcast can become in terms of a research tool which then leads them to their last project so it's kind of it's a standalone they do like maybe a small reflection just like to go hey this this is what was impactful this is how some of the things i saw that were patterns in in some of my interviews but um I try to make it a standalone so like the next project they kind of start meshing things together and really start to see like how multimodality can work really in a collaborative way to even to even heighten the writing space like as well and they not go, just go to a writing but like what happens in the world's kind of come together. But yes, you're not alone in the anxiety that comes from shifting to a podcast. I was so worried. I was like, oh my gosh, these might be terrible. Well, and also one, I feel like, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was, I was, I was just going to say, because it's structurally like built into some circles of our profession or of the professions of academia, teaching and learning is that podcasting right now is 
or can be predominantly seen as like a lesser form. So I feel like those structures, however, we might want to resist them still like inform, well, they certainly inform like our, my department's learning outcomes for different levels. Like I don't see anything about, you know, audio production or oral this or that in my department's um, outcomes, which I'm supposed to align with, right? And so that like structurally that informs what I can do perhaps, although I do like to be a shit disturber, but I am a contract um, instructor. And so I do also like to get hired every four months so that I can continue living with some sense of stability. So just the structural issues I think are informing some of our decisions, my decisions, certainly. I do think that all all of this touches on what I think is um, the subject for one of the, the sessions tomorrow, which is the academic recognition of podcasts. Um, but that when that starts to happen, it will, well, maybe it happens the other way around, but by using them in teaching, it filters up rather than down. Yeah, I don't know if Dr. Hannah McGregor is involved in that session, but I do know that she, um, the po Secret Feminist Agenda podcast producer, as well as Witch Please, um, she has been part of a big grant um, in Canada anyways, looking at how podcasts can get to count more or how we can make sure that podcasts count more in terms of hiring, promotion, et cetera, funding, that kind of thing. So. I wonder if I don't actually know who's involved in these sessions, but <laughs> oh yeah. I love the term shit disturber. I'm just gonna, um, that's great. <laughs> I also will say I had the, I did have the benefit. I was under, I was teaching a class that's under IDST, which is not my department. So in some ways I was like a rogue agent, but um, <laughs> you know. Any other, I know we, we only have five minutes left. Any other, um, I, we, we did give everyone editing access to the handout. So if you have things you would like to add, um, we would just love to have just, you know, resources available. Oh, there's just a question for you from Kim up in the chat. Yeah. Are you, if you can tell us about the national humanities podcast. Oh yes. I'll send the link. Um, so the National Humanities Center um, has the has something called the Podcasting Institute. It's held in the summer. Um, I'm I think this this is the old link. There may be a newer link. This was when I did it. Um, let me also get the link to everyone. Um, but I know we're we're short on time, so I'll send you there. And then I'm pretty sure they're doing it every year. Oh, the new link. Thanks, Kim. Um, and so um, I. Uh, what, what would, what did you like most about it? Okay. So, well, um, one like crazy thing is that, um, you know, Dr. Gregor was a presenter. So that was like my first introduction, um, to her work. Um, but what I really liked is that there is a pretty steep fee to be a part of the podcasting Institute, but part of that fee means they send you all the equipment that you need to do, to create a podcast. Um, so like I got a Yeti mic, um, and I mean, like they used my, the money that I sent them to buy me a Yeti mic, um, my university thankfully paid for it. So I didn't have to pay for it. Um, they, and so I got the mic, some headphones, they give you access to tons of resources. Um, you get one-on-one -on -one time with folks from the San Diego state university, um, digital humanities center. Um, and they'll help guide you through, you get put in a team. When I did it, we got put in teams of four and we created a podcast episode in four days. And while that sounds like, oh gosh, it truly was like, I felt prepared. There were parts, there were times that I felt like, oh no, I don't know if I can do this. Um, but we all did it. And so it was, it was just informative. Um, it was a great networking thing during the pandemic when I just felt kind of disconnected from a lot of things. Um, and so I, I would, I would really recommend it. especially if it's in person because the National Humanities Center is just a dream of a building. Thanks, Brooke. Yeah, of course. And Andy Mink is the VP of programs or something over there and he is just a fantastic human. So um, but yeah, any other? Yay. 
Well, thank you so much for being such a generous and um, engaging audience. This was wonderful. It's my first ever um, humanities podcasting symposium. So yeah, thanks everybody. And thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Jessica. (laughs) (laughs) Fellow podcasters. Yay. Yes. I hope everybody has a good night and maybe see folks tomorrow. Yeah, totally. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Or morning, day. (laughs) For Rhiannon. (laughs) Bye. Bye.